Great. Well, thank you for your patience, everyone, while we were uh, battling with the projectors. Uh, but we finally made it in the end. Uh, and thanks for coming out to our talk. Uh, given that you're here, I figure there's probably uh, a good chance you're like us in that you might have a few too many old video games, uh, might uh, have spent maybe a little too much money on them, but it's all worth it in the end. Uh, but if you're also like us a few years ago, you might have tried hooking up your old game consoles to your TV and thought that it doesn't look as good as you remember, or uh, maybe you think that there's just got to be a better way to take care of that, but you're not really sure what that is. Uh, so we have been through exactly the same struggles uh, and have come across some pretty good solutions. So uh, we're here to share what we've learned. Uh, and before we get started, uh, we'll start by introducing ourselves and uh, give you an idea of the kind of hardware that we're usually playing with. So hi, my name is Carrie. Um, I've been collecting video games for a long time. I've been more interested in, in the past 10 years. Um, I can lay claim to owning every single Super Nintendo, sorry, every single Nintendo console that can hook up to a TV. Um, yay! <laughs> um, my favorite console is the Super Nintendo. I own three of them. One is actually a Super Family. I thought. I know. Cool. I just bought it. That it's the new 3DS XL, but it looks like that it's is very Nintendo. good. I'm it's very beautiful. appreciative of it. <laughs> um, I also have, um, uh, yeah, as you can see, this is my TV setup at home. And it's actually on. You turned it on. It is on. So, hi, oh, I'm Misty. Uh, I mainly collect Sega games. Uh, you can see my Saturn and my Genesis in this photo. Uh, the Saturn is my favorite game console of all time. Uh, my wife, Jessica, mainly connect, collects uh, Sony systems. The PAL PlayStation 2 and the docked PSPs in our setup are hers. I hope no one in here is still using one of these, but if you are, can you raise your hand? <laughs> I actually was not expecting this answer, admittedly. I'm a little bit... Okay. <laughs> So I don't have a, basically um, in the year 2018, you should be avoiding using one of these. Um, uh, no, none of us have VCRs anymore and analog television. Okay, so some of us don't have VCRs anymore. <laughs> and, and, you saw my laser disc player in the last photo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I have a record player, so. Um, so like, yeah, like these, these little devices here are just really inadequate. They combine the audio and they combine the video and they're prone to interference, right? Yes. And we Especially want to... when you link multiple systems together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they do not daisy chain well. Um, and I guess um, if you wanted to talk about what's on the back of the TV now. <laughs> so TVs now usually have about 8 million different ports on them. Yeah. Uh, and retro game consoles will actually hook up to most of these. Uh, but given that many options, it can be kind of hard to tell which is the best option or even what's going to be compatible with your system. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what the options are and uh, what's going to work best for you. You're going to talk about upscaling maybe? Yes. That's, we're yeah. going to get into that. Yay. Yes. Um, so I'm going to open up with talking about, a little bit about resolution in TVs because uh, it does actually help to understand um, how resolution works. So in this shot here, it's a 1080p snapshot from a YouTube test video. Um, it shows uh, a scene here from London. And um, when we talk about resolution, um, we commonly see terms like 4K, 1080p, progressive scan, interlacing, 60 by 9, 4.3, yada, yada, yada. It's not, it, it's a lot, right? Um, for the purposes of this uh, panel, we're going to focus on no higher than 1080p. You don't really need to go about it beyond 1080p if you're working with pixelated games. Um, but it helps to understand how resolution works and how resolution works with a TV. Um, so as I said, this is a 1080p snapshot. And if you take a look at like the street signs here, you'll see like it says Oxford Street and Oxford Circus. And then you'll also notice that it says underground. This is the quality level you get at 1080p. You can, see the, you can see these details that you otherwise wouldn't make out at lower resolutions. Um, when we also talk about 16 by 9, we have to talk about the aspect ratio. So 9 being the side and 16 being across. So if your resolution is 1080, then you have a, basically a ratio of 16. That's compared to uh, 16 by 9 here. So that's, that's the width here. Um, when we break it down to 720, we still see a lot of the... Uh, the image quality here. We can sort of still make out it says Oxford Street and Oxford Circus, and to a certain extent, you can still make up the word underground. 
Broadcast TV pretty much is 720p. If it's not 720p, it's 1080i. There's some 1080p and there's some 4K, but more often than not, you're either gonna get 720 as your best, uh, best bet. And it looks really good. Like, I actually have a hard time when I'm watching on my TV discerning between 720 and um, 1080. Um, some people may be able to nitpick a little bit better on it than, than I, but like, for all intents and purposes, it's great. And then now we're at 480p, and 480p is commonly associated with um, DVD, for example, and we still have season broadcast television that uses it. And at this point here, you cannot make up the word underground, you cannot make up the word Oxford anything there. But, you know, again, like even from like zoomed out, like when you're not, you're not looking at anything in particular, it still looks pretty good. That 480 lines is actually pretty, pretty substantial. 240 next? No. No. 240 next. <laughs> so, Only for watching really old anime on YouTube. <laughs> Consoles output at 240p. There's That's right. That's so, uh, our, uh, when we're talking about these resolutions here, these are all HD resolutions yeah. that we're using on modern TVs and That's modern standard. consoles. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about retro resolutions. Uh, SD TVs use a resolution called 480i, uh, which is uh, displays 480 lines of video at a rate of uh, 60 updates a second. This is what's called an interlaced mode. So instead of updating the whole image at once, it updates half of the image every update. So you get all of the even lines in a picture being updated one frame, then all of the odd lines of an image being updated the next frame. Uh, however, the game consoles that we're probably most interested in here, the ones from the 70s through the uh, mid 90s, those usually used a resolution called 240p. Uh, 240p was technically not a standard resolution. It was actually a really clever hack around 480i. Uh, but it does work on all older TVs. And basically what that does is it updates 240 lines of picture 60 times a second. Uh, the sad news is though, even though 240p just works on old TVs, modern TVs usually don't support it properly. Uh, they will treat it like it's 480i, and they will process it like it's 480i. So you end up getting frames blended together, so you lose some motion. Uh, you end up losing some uh, uh, video effects in your game, like flicker effects will be ruined by that because you're blending two frames together with each other. Uh, and some other things, it just means that it doesn't end up looking uh, as good as it could. Uh, that said, there are some TVs that actually do have 240p support. Uh, a website called HD Retrovision has put together a compatibility listing of TVs they've tested that do and don't work. So that can be a really useful resource to go to. Some of these slides will be available on our Twitters, which I'll have at the end, and um, their links to these are actually embedded in the speaker notes, or in the slides to kind of mix it up. <laughs> and in some of our later slides, we'll also have the URLs to things that we're talking yeah. about on screen, so you can copy those down. Hmm. So if you're lucky, you were able to make use of this particular cable. Um, unlike the RF cousin, it actually splits the audio from the video. And uh, for all intents and purposes, if you had this back in the early 90s or even mid 90s for that matter, it looked great. Um, virtually every console from the NES onward supports this mode. Um, the NES is a little bit of an exception because it only outputs in, uh, in the mono, sorry, mono audio, excuse me. Um, but the thing is, is like, this cable was designed for TVs in the 90s. What happens when you plug this into a modern LCD? What does it look like? And um, it doesn't look very good. Um, this is actually a snapshot via an HDMI capture device gone through, uh, I think it's through the, one of your, your upscaler? I think so. Yeah. Um, Frame Meister or no? Frame Meister, yes, yeah. yeah. The expensive one. Yeah. <laughs> um, your TV is attempting to take what is an imperfect signal and is trying to convert it into something that's digital. It's trying to make pixels out of basically what is not pixels. We're talking about lines, remember. And it doesn't know how to discern these lines and the pixels. It's just taking a signal as imperfect as it is and it's just uh, converting it out. And this is actually a best case scenario, by the way. This is like, you know, I can nitpick this all I want, but like if I had to put up with this and there was no other option, I'd be okay with it. Um, this, however, is not very good. <laughs> and, um, this is from my older TV. Your TV will do things like, will sharpen the image, it'll adjust it, it'll do color matching, all these weird things. 
and it distorts the image. It works fine for your VCR because you don't really need to be, have perfect imagery for that. But because we're working in pixels, this is what you get. And uh, you know, like, even though in Super Mario All Stars where you actually have this particular box art being displayed, it does not um, it does not look like super detailed, but it looks a heck of a lot better than this. And so this here is an example of plugging a composite video cable straight into your TV. Yeah. So uh, before we get started talking about upscalers, I figure it's good to talk about what video cable options you've got to hook things up, even if you're hooking them straight up to your TV. Uh, so these four kinds of cables are the ones that you'll usually have to choose between when you're working with your retro consoles. Uh, the cable in the upper left is the composite cable that we were just talking about. It basically uh, transmits audio separately from video, but it uh, smooshes the video together into a single signal. Uh, and that tends to mean that uh, all of the parts of the video signal will get a bit of interference with each other, uh, which produces the overall video quality, and it also has limited uh, color resolution. The cable on the upper right is called S-Video, and it's a step up from composite. Uh, it transmits the video in two signals instead of one. One of the signals is the brightness information, and one of them is the color information. Uh, that means that you get uh, higher resolution color information, and you also don't get the interference between those two signals anymore, because they're now being transferred separately from each other. Uh, a lot of modern TVs actually still have S-Video ports on the back of them. So uh, even if you're still just wanting to hook things straight into your TV, this can be a really cheap upgrade that will get you quite a bit better video. Do you uh, need separate audio for that, though? You do, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, two of the... Oh, or, sorry. Yes, actually. The, for S-Video, yes. For S-Video, yes. Uh, but it's the same way with the composite video, yeah. where the audio will be transferred separately from each other. Uh, and again, it's the same thing as well with component video, which is the one in the lower right here. Yeah. Uh, so with pretty much anything except the one on the lower left, the audio is going to be carried on separate cables from each other. That's just how it was done back in the day. It's a SCART connection, right? The one yeah. Yes, the one on the lower left is SCART. So both good. of these in the bottom are what's usually called different kinds of uh, component video, meaning UK. that they... Yeah, so uh, the UK, uh, sometimes in Australia, uh, some parts of Japan, used this versions of this one in the lower left. Uh, and the one on the bottom right is what's called YPVPR, or usually just component video. And all of these basically just transmit all of the different parts of the video signal separately from each other. Uh, so it gives you much higher quality than any of the other options. Uh, on consoles that support them, they are usually the very best video signal that you can get. Given the right console and the right thing to hook it up to, you can get something that is as clear and perfect as if it came out of an emulator. One thing I'll add about S-Video is you can actually get adapters that plug into your S-Video port and you can plug a, a composite input in it and I'll just accept it because it's no different really. It just splits it. That's all tech well it's doing there. So. Uh, this screenshot here is an example of the same game on the same console being hooked into a FrameMeister via Composite and RGB. The left half of the picture here is Composite, the right half is RGB. Uh, so I know on the projector you're not going to be able to see it quite as clearly as if it were on a TV, but uh, the difference is still um, really clear. If you clear. turn off these lights, we'll be able to see it uh, more contrast. Uh, I don't think you can turn off the one there. There you there. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. One of, it's one of two ways to do it. <laughs> so that's quite a bit clearer here. Yeah, so you can see here the composite on the left. It's blurry in general. Uh, it's lost a lot of color definition. And especially in the cases where you've got uh, harsh contrasts right next to each other, like on the press start text, you're seeing a lot of rainbow artifacting. Uh, whereas the RGB here on the right is incredibly clear. It's almost perfect, which is really good. Uh, so this is coming off of an original Genesis with uh, RGB and composite cables. And we've got a close-up here, just to make it a bit clearer. Uh, the press start had the most rainbow artifacting in it, so uh, I thought it'd be especially useful to show this off here. You can see that because of the very low color resolution and because of the interference and the composite signal, uh, there's a lot of color bleeding going on and all of that goes away in the bottom one. 
it's just perfectly sharp, perfectly clear, no real problems with that. Uh, so in general, RGB is a lot better, but it is worth keeping in mind that some old games actually design themselves assuming the players were going to have them hooked up by composite or by RF, and so they knew that that blurring was going to be happening, and they designed their graphics around it. So this is a screenshot of Lunar, the silver <coughs> shot for Sega CD, and in this game they use a lot of checkerboard patterns or dithering to uh, approximate transparency. So you can see that on the cables that they expected most players to have back then, uh, that actually blurs itself out so that it looks like the shadow over the water is actually transparency. Whereas with the RGB signal, you can actually see that it is a checkerboard pattern. You don't get any blurring. In general, I still think it looks a lot nicer this way, but it does mean that um, you just have to keep in mind that some of these effects are not going to work anymore. Is similar to aliasing or anti-aliasing? Sort of. It's somewhat. I would say they're related, but I wouldn't say it's a. I wouldn't say it's the same or anything. Okay. Well, one's analog and the other is digital. There is that too. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so some consoles right out of the box work absolutely flawless with this. Um, Sega and Sony in particular are the best consoles for it. Um, Misty's, uh, Misty has a JVC XI, and it is one of the nicest looking consoles I've seen to output RGB. Um, the Genesis, the Saturn, and the PlayStation all do really well. In fact, you can actually um, output, um, um, there's cables for all of these, so you can just do um, other formats as well. This, Nintendo starts getting into a little bit of a dicey territory because the Super Nintendo is a mixed bag when it comes to doing RGB output. It does it natively, you can get the cables, the catch is, is that some Super Nintendos are really good and they have really good quality and other Super Nintendos, they're, they're going to work, but like they're going to have like uh, what is known jail barring, which is where the colors sort of um, kind of go darker and then lighter and dark and lighter. It's like really annoying. The N64 is more problematic. Um, right now my N64 is actually being modified, so it can actually do RGB and that is what you need to do. It needs to actually have... Um, I believe what it is is you need an extra board installed inside extra of it. Chip. It gets soldered on. Exactly, and um, even though it has the same cable, uh, this cable connector, the standard Nintendo connector, it just won't work out of the box. So that's something to bear in mind. And actually, it has the same flaw as the SNES Mini. If you have one of those, it's the same situation. Uh, Misty, what's the thing about the uh, PC Engine, which is the Turbo Graphics 16? If you're not familiar with it. So the PC Engine is in kind of a weird place where out of the box it only comes with a composite cable in the back. Uh, but there's an expansion port that you usually plug the uh, PC Engine CD out onto. Uh, and it actually carries an RGB signal out of it. So you can buy uh, an add-on which plugs into the back by the expansion port and gives you RGB out. So uh, it doesn't take an internal mod the way the N64 or certain Super Nintendos do. It's just going to cost you more money. The uh, NES is a dumpster fire, by the way. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really enjoy talking about modifying the NES. I actually have an NES. I love my NES. But um, the catch with the NES is that um, internally it does composite video and no RGB. So when it processes the signal through its PPU, which is a picture processing unit, it doesn't have any RGB. And the way to do it to get RGB out of it is either to harvest parts from the many, or sorry, from the remaining Play Choice tens that are out there or to get what's known as an HDMI NES adap uh, adapter, which again requires you to do a modification. Both are very intrusive, and um, the latter does introduce some latency. It's not particularly um, the best solution. However, I have a better solution for the NES, and uh, we will be talking about that shortly. Does the Model 2 fare any better? Not really. No. Nope. It's the same problem across all the NESs, except if you can get yourself um, uh, one of the Famicoms that are really Famicom Tyler. yeah, then Famicom Tyler, which does do RGB natively, but you know it's there's a cheaper solution. We're gonna have to repeat to both the N64 about the RGB on the N64 one more time. There's a mod. It's a mod. So there's there's two ways you can do the N64. Is you can there is an HDMI adapter you can get yeah, for it. Mod, yeah. yeah, and then you can also do RGB by doing some modifications internally. It does require like a daughter board. Yeah. So you have to open up the system and solder in some new hardware in there. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't work out of the box, but there are options available. It's, it's less of an dumpster fire than the NES. I, I, I talked to Marshall H, who does the uh, mods for the N64. Mm -hmm.
So before we uh, go back onto the NES, uh, we'll talk a little bit about upscalers and the other options like that that are available. So if your TV doesn't handle 240p or other stuff for retro consoles, or if you just want something to give you some more control, uh, there are definitely some good options available. Uh, if you're in sort of the retro circles, you might have heard the name the Frame Meister or the OSSC. Uh, but uh, how do you decide? What's the difference? Which is better? So there are two basic approaches to digitizing an analog video signal, so you can hook it up to your TV by HDMI. So I'll go over the differences and what the pros and cons are. Uh, so the OSSC, which is the device on the bottom here, uh, is what's known as a line doubler. That basically does some very simple processing, where it takes in the picture, uh, which is a set of lines, and it just doubles or triples uh, the lines and then outputs them with almost no processing. So uh, the advantage that this has is it's incredibly fast. It introduces maybe half a frame of latency. So it's pretty much beyond what anyone can actually detect. Uh, the disadvantage to this is that because the processing is very simple, it limits what it's able to do with it. So the output resolution is limited to being a multiple of whatever the input was. So you can't do 1080p, for example, because 1080p isn't 240p times something. Uh, it also means that certain uh, effects might not be able to be applied to video uh, and other things like that. Uh, it also means that uh, you, if you have a uh, retro game that runs in 16 by 9, needs to be stretched, uh, you need to use your TV to handle it. The scaler won't be able to do things like that for you. The Frame Meister is what is known as a scaler, which is a more complicated type of device. So that takes in the image, it digitizes it, uh, and then internally it's able to do its own scaling and its own processing. So the advantages to this are that uh, you can scale it in various ways that you wouldn't be able to do with a simpler thing like a line doubler, and you can do more advanced processing on it. Uh, this means that you have more choice over resolution and other things like that. But the disadvantage is that this introduces a little bit of latency. So the latency is usually going to be at least two frames. Not all people might be able to detect that, but for, for example, really hardcore Speaking fighting game players, Smash players, uh, shmup players, uh, yeah, might be speed really runners, yeah. speed <laughs> runners, that, yeah. yeah, are, are going to be a lot more sensitive to something like that. I can safely say that uh, GDQ, if anyone's familiar, it uses OSSCs. So and that's that. A friend of mine used to use a Frame Meister for speed running, uh, but she switched not because of the lag, because the games she run don't actually have quite that precise input, but actually just because she was having some trouble with. Uh, color reproduction on the Frame Meister and found that her TV and her capture device was more compatible with the OSSC. Right. Um, both of these options will also generally support PAL consoles, though the uh, OSSC's PAL support is a bit less compatible with TVs. The other main compatibility problem is that the Frame Meister has some trouble with games that switch rapidly between 240p and 480i. Most video games don't actually do this, so for most games it doesn't affect people, but some games released in the mid-90s do have this problem. In particular, some games like Gran Turismo and Virtua Fighter 2, where menus and the game run at different resolutions than each other. Um, did we make mention of Sonic the Hedgehog 2? We didn't. Uh, Sonic 2's <laughs> two-player mode also runs in 480i. Uh, it's the only game for the Genesis that does, and for whatever reason, the Genesis's 480i mode is just a little bit outside of the standard spec. It's something that usually TVs of the era be able to handle it, but as far as I'm aware, no upscalers and no line doubles can do it. So neither the OSSC nor the Frame Meister can do Sonic 2's two-player mode, oh. which is sad. There's no need. <laughs> We're going to be talking yeah. about the price. We've actually got a comparison chart <laughs> coming up here. So uh, an HDMI, uh, sorry, uh, we'll talk a little bit as well about some other cheaper options too. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, an HDTV, uh, if it has native to a 40p support, it might not look quite as good as an upscaler, but it is still an option and it will cost a lot less. Uh, 
many modern TVs still have S-video ports, and you can buy an S-video cable that is perfectly good for maybe five or ten dollars. So if you're still using composite or even RF for your old game console, that is a really cheap and really affordable option that you can do. Um, as well, a company called HD Retrovision makes uh, YPBPR component video cables. Those use the native RGB support in consoles that support RGB, and then they turn it into the component video format that modern TVs use. Those cost a bit more than an RGB SCART cable, but on the plus side, uh, they're compatible with a lot of TVs that handle 240p properly. Uh, and if you decide to upgrade to a scaler or a line upload later, then it'll actually be compatible with that too. So uh, that can be a good bridging option if you're still planning on buying something later. One, one thing benefit of using component, uh, which is what I do, is that you can actually make use of component switchers, which are cheaper than start switchers. So there's a big advantage using those. And we mentioned we were going to be talking <laughs> prices. So we burnt a lot of money on our little projects. <laughs> I will say, uh, when I got my friend Meister, it was a few years ago before they had quite exploded in popularity and before the price difference between the Japanese yen and the Canadian dollar tanked as much as it did. So I did not pay $600 for my friend Meister. <laughs> but you will today. I paid for like $300. <laughs> but today they go for a lot of money. There's some stores you, where you can get them for a bit cheaper than this, but they're expensive no matter what way you cut it. The, um, one of the things you have to keep in mind though is um, there's not a lot of suppliers for these in Canada and so if you will have to import these. Uh, the OSSC, for example, ships out of the UK and so I converted these from, uh, from British pounds and um, fortunately I did not have to pay duty because um, I have a way of not paying for duty sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's the same goes for the frame meisters. So like these things, like unless you're really lucky, you will have to pay the, uh, you know, the duty on it. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Missy. That's fine. Uh, so I was just going to mention, we talked about uh, both Komodo and S-Video cables are really <coughs> cheap, and both of those will usually plug into a lot of TVs now. Uh, that said, the OSSC doesn't have support for these, uh, and that can be a bit of a problem, like uh, with the N64 we talked about earlier, where basically you have to RGB mod your system yeah, to yeah, be able to do it. it. My 3DO is in the same boat as well, and their RGB mods are not available for the 3DO, so my 3DO has to be hooked up through composite to my TV, which is really annoying. Right. Um, so RGB cables are a bit more expensive, uh, but the price I'm talking about here is usually for handmade custom cables that offer really good shielding. So the quality is good. Component video cables from HD Retrovision may be about $20, $25 more than an RGB cable. But like I mentioned before, you have the option of plugging those straight into your TV if you're not ready to make the jump for uh, an OSSC or a FrameMeister yet. And one of the things to uh, bring up just before we move on is like if you do decide to go down just the component route, bear in mind that your TV may not support it. Um, 240p over component does work in some cases, but some other times it'll recognize as 480i. So if you ever buy a cable from HD Retrovision, they actually have a compatibility chart. My rule of thumb is if you have Sony or Samsung, it'll work. If you have Vizio like me, it won't. So just an FYI. Ah, yes. So now we're going to get to alternatives because we kind of dived into a little bit in the last slide. Um, so there's a couple ways to do to go about this differently. Um, you can do some off-the-shelf cheap alternatives. You can do third-party consoles emulation. And we're going to talk about PBMs. PBMs are... Um, kind of really cool. And this is a PBM. It is known as Professional Video Monitor. And these would be used in medical imaging, uh, broadcast television. Um, I think it was also used primarily in video editing. So if you work from home in the 90s and the early 2000s, you would want one of these displays. These displays are meant to be highly accurate. They are meant to um, provide the most crisp image and provide you with most of the, all the inputs you need. It actually has, in most cases, a native RGB port on them. And as you can see here with, with Mario on the right, it looks like a pixelated image. This is not pixels, but because the TV is designed to show you what, it, what you should expect at the best, this is what you're going to get. Upside, the upside of the PVM is like they're sometimes cheap. You can actually find a lot of studios just offloading them because they're switching over to LCDs or they're switching over to a PVM that does digital. Um, the downside though is they are CRT still. They um, do require space, but you can get them up to 32 inches. They're, so you can get a fairly, uh, fairly sized one. But if you want one that goes on your desk, you can actually get a 13 inch PVM and it looks really fantastic. 
another really good cheap option uh, back in the 80s. Commodore, when they were making the yes. Commodore 64 uh, and the Amiga, they made their own video monitors. Yes. Uh, and those usually had at least S video on them, sometimes RGB. Uh, and you can often find those show up at like thrift stores or on Craigslist for 20 bucks. The question at that point really becomes can you find a place to fit it in your house? Yeah. <laughs> and Jessica and I, we do not have a good place for one of these. So the upscaler option is really the most practical for us. But some people might have the room for an old school TV to kick around in their home. I have a no CRT rule in my apartment, and um, the CRT will not be entering my apartment anytime soon. <laughs> Unless it's a Vetrix. And uh, whatever option you do end up going with, uh, it can be useful to make sure that you're actually getting the best quality of video out of it. Uh, so if you're the kind of person who likes to twiddle the knobs, mess around with settings, there's this tool available called the 240p test suite uh, that is available for free for over 10 different retro consoles. It basically gives you a bunch of different test patterns and test utilities to make sure that everything is calibrated and looking like it should. Uh, so if you have a CD-ROM based console, there are burnable CD versions for a few different ones. There are also free ROMs available if you have a flash cart. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a few websites that will, for about $20, sell you a cartridge that has it burned onto it. There's a hack to get the test suite on the N64. You need a flash cart to do it. Yeah, it's one of the ones they ported it to. Yeah. There's also like a Genesis version, yeah. SNES version. Uh, a bunch of different things, a Sega CD and PC Engine CD one for CD-based consoles, stuff like that. Um, so you can always look into alternative consoles as well um, if you want to start going down the road of, um, of you know having a better output. Like this, for example, is a Retron Five. It accepts like an NES. It accepts Genesis, Super Nintendo, Game Boy. And even though the controller is really horrid, you can actually just get your own controllers and plug them right in. Um, the downside though is it is emulation, and the emulators that are on there are not entirely accurate. There's some sound issues, or some weirdness like that. Um, and there's also some issues with licensing, um, a lot of the authors have not been paid um, for this. So there's just something to bear in mind, but like this is an option. Uh, you can also consider alternative consoles. These are not emulator consoles. These are something that I was touching on earlier about alternatives to the NES. So, on the left we have is an analog Super NT, and then on the right we have an analog NT on the bottom and a retro ABS on the top. The Super, this basically one plays Super Nintendo games, one plays um, uh, NES games. They use what is known as a floating point gate array, an FPGA, and the idea behind them is that instead of emulating, you're simulating, and you're simulating the quirks, you're simulating um, every single chip inside of the system. It is designed to replicate the hardware. So for all intents and purposes, it is a Super Nintendo. There's, there's no difference other than the fact that it's just an FPGA. It's doing all the work for you. So it's like a hardware clone? Effectively, but yeah. not like an NES on a chip, just bear in mind. So like an NES on a chip is slightly different. And but the uh, retro ABS as well and uh, the analog NT are actually using some original hardware from the original boards as well. That's correct. So they've yeah. actually, uh, not even a clone, but using some original parts. It's closer to hardware emulation. Yes. That's right. Yeah, the word you want to use is simulation in this particular case. Better than a retro. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the, I believe the NES HDMI adapter is at least $150, and that's not, if you want to get someone to pay to do it free, it's probably going to be an extra $50, $60, right? And they were talking US dollars here, right? The consoles here that are shown is, uh, I believe it's about two, under $200 for the Super NT. It's $150 for, and these are US dollars, by the way. It's $150 for the Retro ABS, and it's about $500 for the uh, Analog NT. I am buying a Retro ABS instead of actually doing anything with my NES, because first of all, it has a slot for both Famicom and NES games, which means I can get rid of all my adapters. Um, it has the four score built in. It also has the ability to play the disk drive games. If you can find yourself a working uh, NES disk drive, or sorry, Famicom disk drive, it'll work. And again, it's $150, and it outputs natively at 720p. I personally recommend doing this over modifying an NES. Just Modding the NES is such a horror show. This is honestly a better option. Mm -hmm. uh, and as well, I might as well mention that there are some officially supported alternatives. Like you're probably aware the Sega ones are garbage and yes. you probably shouldn't get them. Yes. But the Nintendo yeah. ones are actually a lot better. Both of these are emulation based, uh, but the emulators are actually quite good and mm -hmm. they are made by the same internal studio that makes the virtual console games. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they, the hardware on them is also really good, in particular the controllers. Uh, I have one of the uh, PAL SNES minis, and I honestly like the controllers that came with it a little bit better than the original SNES controllers. They're just that good. Uh, they uh, are really easy to set up. You can plug HDMI straight into them, and they come loaded with a bunch of games. And I didn't say this, but there's a really strong hacking community yes. out there. You can very easily add more games to your SNES Mini or your NES Mini. So it's not hard at all. One thing I'll add is that if you do not wish to go down this road, but you want to go and still have all these games, the Virtual Console emulator is the same emulator as uh, what's in these. Um, downside is that the image quality can be a little bit less, um, not as good as the uh, these devices here, because they actually will do all sorts of things like adding in like, um, uh, what was it, scan lines and so forth, just to sort of get that CRT feel, which doesn't exist on the, on the virtual console. Uh, and since I know there's at least one or two speedrunners in the room, I'll mention that, uh, to my understanding, the emulator in the SNES Mini, not the virtual console one, not speedrun legal. Perfect. Mm, interesting. There's another interesting fact about the NES and SNES Mini is they're the same circuit board on the inside, so when you mm -hmm. pack the games, you can do NES games on the SNES and vice versa. Yep, yep, it's exactly. Cool. And also, people have put other emulators the, on them as well. The uh, SNES Minis and the NES Minis now, if you're not getting them in stores, be aware that there are fake ones out there that look identical. But Buy it in a Walmart, Walmart as much as Walmart, so it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. And especially yeah. since the NES Mini are just, is just about to come back in stock. Yeah. A friend yeah. of mine just posted a photo of the Walmart they gave his to him early. They are actually out there now. Um, so if you own your own games, um, it is not illegal to have backup copies uh, of your games. There are devices out there that let you do it. Um, you, you can have one that basically looks like a USB drive when you insert the cartridge, and it works flawlessly. Um, again, it's legal to make backups. Regardless of what the little manual says from Nintendo, it's set you, perfectly legal to have backup copies of your games. Um, there are many cheap solutions to get to work. You can just buy a Raspberry Pi for like, you know, $30 and plus all the other things you have to buy for it anyway. But for under $100, you can have an emulation station um, that it even has, like, you can get a TV friendly interface, like all open source, so you don't have to spend more than the hardware. And again, you can also use your mobile devices. There's some good emulators on there. Um, in particular, here, um, we got BeastNest, which is a highly accurate NES emulator, sorry, Super Nintendo emulator. The author of it goes to great. Um, great pain to emulate the problems the Super Nintendo has, because some games do actually take advantage of the quirks the console has. And it it does well. You just have to have a machine with ample processing. My little MacBook Air probably can't do BeastNest very well, but my desktop can. So, And if you're interested in emulation and these quirks, uh, the author of BeastNest, who goes by Bu, wrote an article on it for Ars Technica a few years ago. Uh, so if you Google Bu Ars Technica, you can find this talks a lot about a lot of the problems with emulation, uh, a lot of the cases where BeastNest has actually fixed some problems that other emulators have, like a game that ran 50% too slow in SNES 9X, uh, mm -hmm. and other weird stuff like that, or a game that for about 10 years no one realized crashed on the seventh stage, uh, and BeastNest was the only one that actually let it be playable all the way to the end. I miss BeastNest. <laughs> they stopped developing it. Nope, it's, it's back. It's yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and RetroArch is a good way to get these nests as well. Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this is how you burn money. And uh, it's, it's a very uh, expensive but sometimes rewarding hobby. Um, we have some resources. Do you want to? So the uh, top link here is uh, the uh, Upscaler Wiki. This was originally created for the XRGB series of upscalers, like the Framemeister, but it actually covers a lot of other stuff now, too. It's a really good resource if you want to read about options that are out there. Uh, the Retro RGB website is also a really good website with a lot of resources covering, you know, I have this console and I want to hook it up. What's the best way? What are the options or the problems I'm going to face? This site just has really good documentation on a lot of that. So uh, it's the best resource that's the easiest to read. And um, yeah, we also have our Twitter handles, um, Misty. Kate Lipsy. My name's not Kate, it's Carrie, by the way, but I go by Kate Lipsy. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to talk to someone about PAL consoles in Australia, Jessica here, who is kindly filming us, um, is can talk to you all about 576i. <laughs> We've only been able to test PAL consoles on our upscalers, thanks to Jessica and her PAL PS2. 
ideas. So, uh, yeah, so I think and, we're in, oh, um, sorry. I do tend to talk about retro games on my <clears> Twitter. <throat> uh, in particular, lately I've been doing some fan translating of some old games in the Lunar series of RGBs. So. Fantasy Five Kings. <laughs> sorry, I do say good games. Aww. Misty has a year-long Twitter thread just about her translating Lunar not like I think it started like May of last year or something like that. It was after the last retro game fest. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, for me, um, I usually talk about um, stuff related to my job, uh, but on top of that, it's usually just me posting selfies or the odd time. Um, I actually do have something video game related, or it's something really absurd, and I decide to go into a giant rabbit hole like Thomas the Tank Engine last night. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah. So any questions or comments? Like super happy to take anything. I think. I realize this was a bit of information overload here, but yeah. covered quite a bit there, yeah. I will make a PDF of the slides uh, probably tonight or tomorrow, um, and uh, I'm assuming we'll probably put the video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So we'll try and put them together and I'll tweet it out. Yeah. Uh, so you can at least go revisit this. And uh, I might even throw a few extra links in there just to um, cover any cover any bases that we may have missed, or who knows, because who knows what we'll come up with when I put this out there. Mm -hmm. Would you cool. mind learning more about the OSSC, like how much it costs, where to get it? Um, so, you can, so just OSSC is available through Video Game Perfection, is the name of the company. And you're looking at about 189 um, British pounds for that. And so that works out when you buy like the, the remote, and you do want the remote, and you want the overlay for the remote, and um, <clears throat> The power adapter works out to about like 310 Canadian, which is how I came up with that number. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, on top of that, the fact that you have to pay VAT, which is their equivalent of uh, sales tax, and then you may have to pay uh, um, duty. So it probably is going to be about 400 Canadian to actually get an OSSC. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Um, if anyone's interested, I run a Facebook page for Master OSSC Club, which um, has over 1,300 members. <clears throat> And some of the moderators on the page are Firebrand X, who does the mm -hmm. best profiles. I know of him, yeah. Uh, yep. For Framemaster and OSSC, and also Artemio, who's the creator of the 240 test suite. So mm -hmm. it's if anyone wants to join it, it's a really good. Uh, Could you tweet sort of, at me the URL for that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that'd so be great. You can get direct access to these guys, and there's also 1,300 people who know a lot about this kind of stuff, including um, anything cross. Cross on like switches, um, you can, it goes very deep down the rabbit hole if you want to go. So yeah, feel free to join. Awesome, yeah, definitely. If you can send it my way, I'm on the Facebooks. So yeah. yeah. It'd be nice to have a, a more official version of the test suite for N64. I looked on the wiki and I didn't see one, so I just grabbed the NES version and used the NES emulator for my flash card. Well, Timmy is the creator of it, so yeah. he's the moderator on it. So he didn't search for awesome. it. That's the, if no one else has any other questions, um, thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, you said that your uh, Mac OS is a MacBook Air? Yes. Yeah. Is that struggle with emulators? Uh, what year is it? Oh, this is 2015. I'm talking about BeastNest in particular. BeastNest on, on here does actually struggle a bit. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, does it run all the other emulators? Oh, yeah, it just runs it fine. Yeah, like I, I've run ZSNES and uh, SNES 9X and all the various emulators that don't have the same accuracy and it works just fine on here. Okay, so it's a new version. Everything that, uh, Beast needs a 3 gigahertz processor. <laughs> the new version of Beast Nest that's coming out is uh, going to focus on performance a bit more, so you might actually have more luck with the new version uh, than with older versions. Oh, yeah. okay. What about stuff like Dreamcast PS2? Are you able to manage no. it on your MacBook? No idea. I've never done it, actually. And I have a, I have a Dreamcast and a PS2 anyway, so I have never tried. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. I, I'm going to close everything up. So thank you very much again. Thank you, everyone.